recording. Okay, lab is recording. This is April 15th, 2021, Plant Taxonomy, Humboldt State University. Okay, uh, so first things first, you can find all these activities on your lab uh, module for this week. All right, you've got to key an unknown plant, that's a required assignment. You also need to watch all four of these videos. I know they're a little bit long, but you can always increase the speed if you'd like, or you know, uh, just break it up, watch each one separately. Some of you may have already done this as it was the assignment on Tuesday. I'm not feeling well, so we're going to not be covering these groups during this lab section. I am happy to meet with any of you um, like next week if or during the weekend even if you'd like to go over this material individually all right but what we are going to do is run through some powerpoints of groups that or taxa that were not included on this page and the first one that we're going to talk about is acer you know acer as the maples which you've probably encountered before all right they the standard maple has this palmately lobed, <clears throat> lobed leaf and also this special type of winged fruiting body that is called a Samara. All right, it has its own sort of name. Well, it's kind of complicated. It also splits at maturity. So it's also called a schizocarp. It's like a false Samara. We'll talk about that, don't worry. Okay. So let's just run through some of these characteristics nice and quick, all right? Acer can grow as a tree or a shrub. So this palmate architecture that's pretty darn consistent. The degree and the depth of the low of depth of the lobes can change between individual species, okay? They have these very, very small flowers, all right? Fantastic, you see another picture. And here's that note about the fruit being a schizocarp, okay? And we do call these samaroid, all right, because they are like a winged samara, but because they, they break at maturity like this and then fall, they are called uh, schizocarps. Schizo meaning split, same root as with like schizophrenia, okay? All right, here are those really reduced flowers that I was talking about right here. They're pretty darn neat, pretty good looking. Some videos of these things falling. Here's a slow motion video of one of these spiraling. Reducing the rate of the fall allows the fruit to be carried further, okay? And there are many species that actually have palmately lobed leaves that aren't in, that aren't in the genus Acer. Okay, so our first is one that you've all seen before, and that is a member of Ribes. Okay, uh, in fact, both the left and the right images here are different members of the genus Ribes. Now that I'm looking at them right here. Okay, so sometimes, as you may know, you'll just be encountering plants that only have vegetative tissue. And the flowers and fruits of Ribes are very obvious. They're very clearly not the flowers and fruits of an Acer. However, sometimes you'll just be seeing the actual, um, the actual leaves. So it's good to be able to tell these things apart, right? Leafing uh, branching order, which was, which was covered on a previous slide, whereas it? it's right here. Simple opposite branching leaves opposite branching pattern of those leaves, right? That's going to help you because a lot of the members of Ribes don't have that, okay? That's everything for Acer. It's pretty darn straightforward. You're always gonna know you're looking at an Acer when you have those palmately lobed leaves along with those special schizocarps with the wings on them, okay? Cool. Uh, great. It is a, it's a nice genus because it's got a lot of, cons it's very consistent. Okay, got another one here. Let's look at Betulaceae. Okay, cool. Fantastic. <coughs> Excuse me, gosh. 
So, Betulaceae's are the birches. There's a lot of birches around here. You'll see them growing uh, a lot in riparian areas. Okay, they have these special, these special inflorescences that are called catkins. Okay, it looks like a spike, right, with all the flowers pressed directly to the central axis. Okay. Usually they are unisexual, but the plant is actually um, the plant is actually monoecious, so it has female inflorescences and then male inflorescences. And you'll see an example of that in an upcoming uh, slide, I can guarantee. All right, so they're pendant, meaning that they hold, that they lay down, right? That they that they hang, they, they hang down. They also have these bracts that subtend the individual flowers. You can see them in the image right here. And one of the big things that we're talking about this week is wind pollinated versus animal pollinated plants. <laughs> Sorry. Wind pollinated flowers tend to be a lot less showy, okay? Because they don't need to attract an animal there to use as a vector. They just need to produce the pollen and expose the stigmas for fertilization to occur. What are our required taxa? We have Betulaceae, the birch family. You need to know some family traits. We have Betula, the birches, and then we have Alnus, the alders. I'm looking out my window right now and I see a big old batch of alders. Once you get a look at them in this PowerPoint, you're gonna realize that you've probably seen a lot of them too. Once again, both, both of these required taxa grow a lot in riparian areas or along the banks of rivers. All right. <coughs> oh man, family traits, okay? Shrubs to trees. Shrub versus tree really depends on the height, the size of a plant, all right? They've got alternate leaves. They have these double serrate margins, which are going to become very clear as we talk about them. Also, um, sometimes these margins are reticulate, where they actually fold over at the edge. And that's a really good indicator that you're looking at an alder, but I'm sure we'll be talking about that. Okay. Catkins, all right, with female and male catkins. Some of them are going to be entirely male flowers. Some of them are going to be entirely female flowers. When you see, for example, an alder's male inflorescence, it looks a lot like a small, small pine cone, okay? Very reduced perianth because these flowers do not need to be showy as they are wind pollinated, all right? Now, these are actual Samaras, usually in this family, okay? Real Samaras meaning that they are winged fruit, that does not split at maturity. So it's not a sky so carp like in the maples. They're not gonna hang in those doublets that you see on a maple tree. They're individuals. They're individual separate Samaras, okay? The alders, all right? The alders are deciduous trees. They lose their leaves in the winter, right? Um, the leaves are coming back currently on the alders outside of my place because it's spring, right? That's all the sense in the world. Okay. Now, when we talked about the Fab AC, I brought up multiple times this idea of a symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria, which can take atmospheric nitrogen, which plants can't use and convert them to convert it to an accessible form for the plants. All right. So alders can also do this. Members of the genus Alnus can also do this. It is not unique to the Fabaceae, okay? And there are also, I should note, free living nitrogen fixing bacteria, okay? So these things have a symbiosis, but it's not limited to a specific, um, it's not limited to a specific species, if that makes sense. There can be different plants and different bacterial species. I believe there's only really two genera of nitrogen fixing bacteria though, that do form a symbiosis with plant roots. So you can keep that in mind. All right. Though we're not gonna be 
most likely not going to be tested on that unless she's brought it up in lecture there. Okay, <clears throat> cool. Let's take a look here at the inflorescences of an ulnus. Here we have the female inflorescence, okay? Uh, here we have the male inflorescence, all right? Not a lot of perianth here because they just need to disperse these things via wind, okay? Cool. Uh, female catkins, woody persistent bracts. Because they look like at maturity. Okay, see how I said that that was like a, a pine cone, the mature, uh, mature female inflorescences. Okay, the pine cone. All right, so you'll definitely be seeing those around. Red alder, Ulnus rubra. All right, you're not required to know the species, but this is the most common type of alder that you'll spot around Humboldt. Okay, good stuff. Uh, you can see that the different sides of the leaf are in fact colored differently. There are some trichomes on the bottom of the leaf, the abaxial side. Remember, if a leaf is extending uh, from a plant, the abaxial side is the side that doesn't face the central stem. The adaxial side is what would normally be, you would normally call the upper surface. Okay, upper, lower, great. <clears throat> All nusses and birches have somewhat similar bark, but you're going to see that the birch bark is, is different here. Okay, female catkins, male catkins. Male catkins are usually bigger and they've got more flowers. The female catkins are smaller and cone-like, okay? And you can see that these are in fact Samaras, that is a winged fruit that does not split, it's just a single seed, well, single seed held within this winged structure to allow for better wind dispersal here. Okay, great. Fruit can also be a winged nut, okay, like this. These do not have very obvious wings though, all right? So all in this, when you see those catkins and you see that doubly serrate leaf margin, you're gonna be pretty confident that you're looking at a uh, number of the genus Alnus. Okay, great. Now we look at Betula, okay, the birches. Some birches have this really white papery bark that peels off, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, sometimes it even, as it's peeling off, it looks like somebody's glued like a flyer to a, to a tree, you know? So that's what we get sometimes, but they do not all have that style of bark. The peeling is pretty common within the betula, right? But the very white bark is not ubiquitous. Okay, great. Betula, betula leaves. All right, so these also have these doubly serrate leaf margins. Okay. Let's take another look at the alder leaves. They're very similar. Right. But you're gonna see some differences, uh, some very minor differences in these, okay? So female catkins have a much more papery bract that falls apart at maturity, as opposed to the coney, the cone-like, very hard, persistent bracts in the female catkins of Alnus. Okay, other than that, they're pretty similar. All right, these are both in the same family. They have a lot of sim similar characteristics. Okay, the wings are a little bit more prominent, as you can see right there. But the real thing is that they fall apart. They are not persistent. All right, more betula, fantastic, good stuff. These are really gorgeous trees. So they have the real white bark, the real peely white bark. Pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, so you might have a quiz that has some question about like, which member of the betulaceae forms a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria or something like that. If that sort of question shows up, remember, allness is the one that has that, okay? Great. 
And now we've got some slides of another member of Betulaceae that is not required. It's Corylus or Corylus, all right? And this is the uh, hazelnut, okay? Also has these catkins, all right? The fruits are really cool because they're still protected by this, uh, what we call an involucre, which is like a protective sheath made by a leaf, a modified leaf. Uh, you've seen them in like tomatillos, okay? And there is cool information in here, um, but I'm just gonna actually leave this to you to review if you're curious, because this is all actually very interesting. There's something about the, uh, one of the bullet points is that the young, uh, the young hazelnut growth is really useful for making baskets and other things like that. However, uh, in order to get that young growth consistently occurring, you need to burn the trees or, you know, because then this triggers new growth to occur. It's just cool. It's an interesting type of forest management and fire management. Okay, so I'm going to apologize again for the fact that I'm moving through this a little quickly. And I really hope that y'all are, yeah, I'm sure that you're all very understanding. We've all been in situations like this, right? Okay, let's see here. Now we've got, what do we have left? We have Thegesi and Salicaceae. Okay, so we're keeping it going with some more trees. Okay. All right. These are also wind pollinated plants, which you can kind of tell from that type of non showy inflorescence. It's just focused on dispersing the pollen into the wind. Okay, good stuff. It's all the same stuff that we've been talking about in the other groups. Unisexual inflorescences, pendant, bracted, associated with wind pollination. Okay. So in the oak family, which is Phagaceae, all right, you need to, excuse me, <laughs> learn family characteristics and then learn a couple of genuses. All right, Quercus and Notholithocarpus. Phagaceae right. is an oak. Cool. Okay, so these have alternate leaves and they have a lot of variety in the margins and the shapes. If I'm, um, I don't think that there are many that have that same doubly serrate thing, doubly serrate leaf margin that you see in the Betulaceae. Okay, cool. Now the female flowers in these are not in catkins and they produce nuts. Okay. So you've seen oak fruits, I'm sure of it. All right. Members of Quercus are the true oaks. Okay. So the Phagaceae is the oak family. And then you have the genus Quercus, which has the oaks. Oak woodlands are, in, in my opinion, some of the most beautiful types of landscapes. They're really cool with these spread out plants, a nice healthy understory. Right, they're just really, really neat. We've got some great oak woodlands near here. Okay, now they can be shrubs, they can be trees. Often in these oak woodlands, they've got these open forest floors that just make them very magical. Okay, you've seen oak leaves, I'm sure. I'm sure you've seen some oak leaves. They are usually pinnately lobed. So these aren't compounded, but they have those lobes running along, okay? All right. They can be evergreen. There are some evergreen members of the genus Quercus. They are alternate and they are simple. So they are not compounded, even though sometimes they may be very deeply lobed and might actually look like they are compound leaves. Okay, so I talked about how variable these margins are, and that can be a frustrating characteristic, but it can also be a useful characteristic. For example, these margins are all taken from, these leaves are all taken from the same individuals, and you can see that there's a ton of variability in what the leaves look like. So a highly variable leaf like this will be um, easy to ID as a member of Quercus. Also, if you, if you do happen to see a fruit on one of these, right? 
you really can't mistake the fruit of a of an oak. Okay, fantastic. So we, here we have all of our uh, male catkins, right? This image is here to show you that these are clearly wind pollinated because they dump so much pollen off if you just whack them. Okay, flowers hang out, the female flowers, I'm sorry, hang out in the axles. Okay, the axles where the leaves meet the stem. All right, staminate flowers, so the male flowers, okay, hang in the catkins of the pistolate flowers or the female flowers are in the leaf axles. That's going to be the way that you're seeing probably how the female inflorescence is um, actually going to be very useful in telling these taxa apart. Okay, great. More Quercus, okay? I don't think I've actually said that these are called acorns. Right now, when you're determining different, when you're keying out different members of Quercus, one of the most uh, useful characteristics to note is the degree to which the cup surrounds the acorn. Okay, sometimes it'll completely surround it, sometimes it'll just be a little piece on the top, like so. All right, yeah, acorns. All right, acorns coming from oaks, they're pretty. Uh, darn cool. Okay. Great. So um, these produce these edible nuts, right? These acorns. And that should indicate to you that these are actually animal dispersed seeds <clears throat> and not wind dispersed seeds like we've seen in the other groups that we've talked about so far. So far, everything we've talked about has a wind dispersed seed and wind pollination. However, Quercus has wind pollinated flowers, but has animal dispersed seeds. Okay, female flowers in the leaf axles, very important for this. Okay, cool. Uh, basically covers everything we need to know about this. Then there's a final genus for you, uh, which is Nothoolithocarpus. Okay, the tan oak. All right. All right, perfect. Um, so let's see here. We're going to try to find you some nice, um, actual, some characteristics that you can use to differentiate these from other members. Okay, cool. In Nothoolithocarpus, you don't have the lobes. So these tan oaks are going to be um, different than the other oak leaves that we've talked about. Like we're gonna to talk to you about how they're usually, how many of them are very deeply lobed, pinnately lobed like this. In the tan oaks, you have a more simple margin which can, which can vary to being uh, serrate. Let's take a look at this young leaves with a powdery exudate, okay? So these powdery tan oak, that's where it gets that name, okay? This does fall off, so it can't be always, you can't always count on it as a um, characteristic, okay, to key with. See, it's not there. All right, great. So leaves can be serrate as well. Let's take a look at some more. Um, let's take a look at some more characteristics here. Here's a great character right here, okay? The classic oaks that you're probably used to seeing have these overlapping scales on their acorns. All right, these are, the, these are members of Quercus, whereas in Nothoolithocarpus, the bracts that are making up the involucre, which makes up the cap of the acorn, curve back, okay? And these can be retained on the plant rather than falling off with the acorn, okay? Great, Nothoolithocarpus is only one species in California. These are actually insect pollinated. Okay, all right, good stuff. Uh, we don't have pendant catkins, we have erect catkins. All right, fantastic. Uh, and the female flowers are at the base of the male catkin, okay. And the fact that there are nectaries present relates to the fact that these are actually insect pollinated. Okay, so here's a nice slide that tells you how you can contrast 
Quercus and Nothalithocarpus because there aren't that many things that really tell them apart, okay? So insect-pollinated Nothalithocarpus, wind-pollinated Quercus. Male catkins are erect in Nothalithocarpus, pendant in Quercus. The fruit has recurved bracts in Nothalithocarpus and does not in Quercus. That's the uh, involucre thing right here. I'm sorry, my bad. Um, fantastic, cool. And then the leaves in Nothalithocarpus are usually simple to um, serrate, but you can't really count on that all the time. Okay, now we've got some slides for interested minds. And once again, we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of leave this to you to look at. I, I always liked this name, Quercus Garyana. It's like, oh, it's, it's got a, it's just named Gary, which is kind of fun, okay? So got some cool stuff here, some neat slides about some different oaks, okay? And there's a lot of variety, as you can see. It's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff, all right? But I just don't have it in me to run through it all. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's see here. So we've run through the Solanace. We've, uh, we've, got this, we've got that done. Fagacy's done. Salicacy. Cool. Okay. Oh, give me one second as I snag a quick drink of water. All right, we're back. So, Salicaceae is the willow family, another riparian species. We talked about a few riparian species here. And look at this, this PowerPoint slide has one of those nice back, uh, black backgrounds. All right, cool. So another sort of thing, right? Uh, where we're talking about shrubs to trees, okay? The leaves have these stipules, you know, that subtend the, the leaf's um, stalk. All right, we've talked about those in a couple of species and you're gonna see them very clearly in the salix. That's the characteristic that I always found really, really useful in determining that you are in fact looking at a uh, salix, okay? Or remember a salicaceae. Anyways, we're gonna talk about two different genera within salicaceae. You've got the salix, which is the willow, and you've got the populus, which has the poplars, cottonwoods, and aspens in it. We have a lot of similarities to members of Betula, but don't worry, we'll give you some stuff to tell them apart. Okay, cool. So, so the willows can be really freaking gorgeous, right? Especially when they start catching the wind like this. All right, cool. Um, the, let's see, what's some cool stuff about Salix? Uh, salicylic acid is present in the bark of willows which was traditionally used as a pain medicine, right? And is now synthesized in the lab. A modified version of the, of the molecule is synthesized and is used to produce aspirin, okay? So that's a little bit of interesting trivia right here, okay? Let's look at some more uh, members of Salix. And just to make it really frustrating, you do have some very small species of this, okay? very small species, very reduced species, okay? Including shrubs and trees. Usually the leaves are longer than they are wide. And most of the time when you see a full willow tree, it's a very long, very narrow leaf. And around here, if I'm not mistaken, the native leaf, I'm sorry, the native willow species do possess these stipules. And you can see the stipules right here. They're these paired leaves at the base of the leaf. They're these paired leaf-like growths at the base of the leaf, I should say. Okay, cool. They also have these bud scales. Okay. So these have a single bud scale and their axillary buds, and it makes them appear very smooth because there's just one, one basically it's a bract basically, right? growing over the bud as opposed to other buds. And we have seen a few of these. We pointed out a lot of them in the gymnosperms. And we took, I pointed out some of those when we were doing our walks to compare. Um, 
to compare, uh, what was I comparing there? Um, I think it was the ABs comparing to the, uh, gosh, I'm totally blanking on the other species. Point of the matter is you've seen some of these buds and in the salix, they look different. They're very, very smooth, okay? As opposed to these overlapping scales. Here's another image, all right? And when these bud scales open up, all right, and the buds start to grow, you get what are called these uh, pussy willows, all right? They're really kind of cool, they're super fuzzy. They look like little rabbit's feet or something like that, okay? Once again, we've got separate male and female catkins growing in the Salicaceae. However, however, these are actually di dioecious species or a dioecious genus, okay? So you'll see a male willow tree and you'll see a female willow tree. They're separate organisms, okay? Here's what the staminate inflorescences kind of look like. These are the male inflorescences. So, so pistillate inflorescences may look like, okay? And don't forget in the salix, it's gonna be dioecious. So you'll see them on separate trees. Cool. Hairy seeds, just like when those buds open up, the, the fruit is a capsule, okay? That splits to produce many hairy seeds. The hairy stuff helps aid in wind dispersal. Okay. Cool, great. So the big thing here, one of the big things that's gonna help you determine you're looking at salix is the dioecious nature of the plant, all right? And here we have more of the standard issue, super linear long leaves right here. All right, cool. Individual flower out here, the staminate flower. So it's got the anther and the filament making up the stamen, right? And it's a very reduced flower that does have a nectary, meaning that these must be insect pollinated. You do see a lot of bugs buzzing around a uh, willow when it's flowering. Okay, excuse me. Another image, okay? And there's a link here to look at this um, nature walk, nature watch thing, if you're interested. Okay, I've already mentioned how the flowers are insect pollinated because they have these nectaries. Good stuff. All righty. <laughs> so in the Jepson manual, there is a key to the pistillate plants and a key to the staminate plants. Yeah, um, so there are multiple paths to go in the Jepson manual that will still get you to the genus and to the species, say love, the whatever species of salix you're looking at, okay? There's also a key in case there are no flowers, okay? So it is completely uh, possible to still find this, to still key out these species, even though there are all these different uh, instances, okay? So you'll key down to salix, and then you'll have a key for vegetative plants and then a key for pistillate plants and then a key for staminate plants. So like with a lot of species, something that you may have noticed, if you have the flowers present, it's a lot easier to key them out. All right, great. Fantastic. So uh, yeah. You'll see a lot of the time willows have these galls Okay, and galls are a really interesting thing that um, that insects do, okay, where they actually embed their young into the leaf tissue. And then the insect gets fed by the plant. The plant is triggered via some hormonal cues to invest a lot of resources into these galls. And then the plant, the insect lives off of it. Okay, pretty cool. Willows are very common, very common riparian species, okay? And they stabilize riverbanks, a lot of other things. Willows are important, okay? And I'm sorry, I, this is actually really interesting. I'm just so low energy. I do apologize again. All right, so we're just gonna keep moving through it. 
populous. Okay. It's got your poplars. It's got your cottonwoods. It's got your aspens. Also similar to the birches sometimes. All right. But similar to the salicaceae and having these very, very hairy seeds. The leaves are going to be different. Okay. In populus, it's pretty common to have um, a, chordal, a chordate to deltoid sort of leaf shape. It's like a triangular leaf shape. There's actually, um, in populus especially, the leaves are often triangular. Okay. Um, there's a, some very interesting, some, one species, the trembling aspen, it has a flat petiole on the leaf right here, right? And that catches the wind and makes the leaves flip back and forth, which is why it's called trembling aspen. And it makes a really, really cool noise in the wind. It's wonderful. Okay. Salic uh in populus. Okay, so not salix. These are wind pollinated. There are no nectaries in the flowers. Okay, some images of cottonwoods. Quaking aspen. I'm sorry, I said it was trembling aspen. It's my bad right there. Okay, so these trees make these really, really cool patches, like really cool uh, spread out groupings. And that has a lot to do with the fact that in members of populace, they can actually grow uh, via rhizomes. So these are all the same organism, most likely. And there's an underground stem, which these are arising from. Pretty cool stuff. Here's that, oh, I didn't know, I actually didn't know they were gonna have an image of this. It's pretty cool. Um, here's an image of the quaking or trembling aspen, all right, with this flattened, petiole, all right, and it makes the leaves flitter, flutter like that. Okay, cool. So this is what a good study guide would look like uh, for these sorts of things, because as you can probably tell, I've thrown a lot of stuff at you today that's very similar. This PowerPoint file is available on the website, all right? Okay, so we made it through that stuff. And that's everything that we've got that's not uh, included. That's not included on the website. So I really appreciate everybody's understanding. Once again, I'm going to leave you to watch these videos. They are nicely prepared and they will fill you in on the additional groups that we didn't actually cover in the lecture. There are also PowerPoints that are available if you just want to go through the slides and don't want to watch these uh, recorded versions of the PowerPoints with a narration. There is a keying activity, and I'm going to end the recording now, and then we'll have a quick discussion about that. Thank you very much for watching the asynchronous lecture, if you're watching this asynchronously, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And there we go.